Hi everyone. One of the most important tasks you have as someone who's creating animations is to make sure that your animations you create are performant, are fluid, and run really nicely when seen on big devices and small devices and everything in between. So in this video, I'm going to show you a very simple trick that will ensure that if your app has any performance problems, animations aren't what is causing them. All right, let's get started. So at a very high level, have your browser. And the browser to many of us is just a thing that we use to browse through web pages, to interact with your applications, and to do a lot of things that seem really boring. But under the covers, your browser is actually a very complex piece of software. And I want to gloss over a lot of the complexity and focus on two things. There are two things your browser delegates a lot of its work to. One is the CPU. That is the primary unit that your computer or your devices have for handling a lot of things your browser does, such as executing your code, dealing with layout, all the CSS styles you have, your CPU handles it, processing input, and talking to our next colleague here, the GPU. The GPU, or what most of us have been calling it for many years, the graphics card, and it primarily does one thing and one thing really well and really fast, that is drawing things to the screen. And everything else it does are really not that interesting, at least not for the purposes of, the, of this video and what we're trying to learn. But what we really care about is animation. And animation is nothing more than something being drawn to the screen. And a thing that's been drawn to the screen is drawn and redrawn many times a second, ideally 60 times a second. So it seems like something that's great for the GPU to deal with. But when it comes to animating things that we're moving around the screen or rotating or making larger or smaller by scaling it, Oftentimes the work falls on the CPU. Your CPU is already pretty much pegged when it comes to your browser in executing your JavaScript and doing all these other things that are also very crucial for getting your page to display. What we really want to do to get the most performance of our animations is to move as much work from the CPU doing the work to the GPU. And more specifically, we want to make sure that any work related to animating the movement of things, that work falls on the GPU. And the way we're going to do that is by making some slight changes to how we define our animations and more specifically how we define the properties that specify how an element is going to be moving around the screen. So historically, we've probably been using margin padding top left, bottom or right for setting the position of items, for arranging where they appear. And it might have looked a little bit like this. So in this case, I have the left property set to zero pixels and I have a transition defined where I'm looking for changes on a left property and when a change is detected, an animation will play where it goes for half a second using the ease in out easing function. Now, that's not terrible, but the problem is we're trying to make our animations very performant. And the problem is this. Each time we change those properties, bottom, top, left, right, margin, and padding, our browser does some extra work. It does a recomputing of the entire layout. And that is just not cool, especially if what we're doing is an animation where the values, like in this case our left property, the values will be updated 60 times a second. That means the layout is being updated 60 times a second. And what really means is that to go back to the earlier slides we had, our CPU is doing a lot of unnecessary work. There's no reason for it to be laying out our content, especially for an animation where we really don't care how the content is being laid out as long as the thing we're animating is animating properly and smoothly. So the way we're going to fix it is very simple. We're going to avoid the relayout problem by using a transform, by using the CSS transform property. And that by itself reduces the amount of work done by the CPU. And we're going to force the work to not only happen less on the CPU, we're going to force more work on a GPU by using the translate 3D or scale 3D transform functions for ensuring that all the movement that we do is not only a transform, but a transform done on the GPU. So two birds, one stone, very simple and elegant solution. So before we start looking at the technical details, the translate 3D function is one of the values can pass to a transform property. And this function is pretty simple. It allows you to move an element horizontally, vertically, or in this case, the Z order space. Now, this is actually very important, and I have magic written here as a tongue-in-cheek value, but realistically, the positions you really care about are X and Y. The X cares about the, specifies the horizontal movement of things, and Y specifies the vertical movement of things. Just those two elements are all you need to set for most of the animations you create. But the Z value 
just setting anything for the Z value is the magic that specifies this particular animation is going to be happen happening in the GPU as opposed to the CPU. And that's why, even though I don't call it out as a major thing that affect your animation and what people see, it does affect the performance, which indirectly might affect how people perceive what the, uh, the animation that you are creating. So the earlier snippet that we saw where we had the left value specified might look a little bit like this. Instead of having left zero pixels, we have transform and then translate 3D and then three copies of zero pixels to indicate that we want a zero value for our initial state. And then transition is listening for value changes on the transform property. And if any value were to change, preferably the transit 3D values, we'll create animation, same as before, half a second with an ease in out function. Okay, so far we've seen a lot of slides and a lot of theoretical information, but we haven't actually written any code. And that always makes me a little uneasy, especially for something as important as this, where I think the more practice you get, the more comfortable you'll be undoing many years of setting the properties like top, left, margin, padding, bottom, and right, but starting to use something like Translate 3D. So let me start with a simple example. So here I have a, a simple transition here. You might have seen this example in some of the articles I've written in the past. What I have is simply a, a grid of four images. And when you hover over one of these images, it slides up and down. It's actually pretty simple. Like for example, the way it works is that each image is basically created in two halves, a, a top half and a bottom half. And what I've done is create a viewport that kind of clips the other half of the image up. And when you hover over it, the other half slides into view, pushing the other side away. So nothing too complicated. It's pretty simple. If we look at the markup, you can see that I basically have a div with like four images. And the magic really happens with the animation is in these two style rules right here, where initially I'm setting the top value to zero. And then when I'm hovering over the you know, over an image, the top value is set to negative 150 pixels. And the animation is caused by this transition here where I'm specifying that you listen to the top property for any changes. And then when a change is detected, as in 150 pixels has been shifted, you animate the change from zero to 150 over 0.2 seconds using the ease in out easing function. Pretty simple. Now, using what we just learned from what we saw, what we wanna do is actually not animate using top, but actually use the translate 3D values. So let's go ahead and see what we can do. So the first thing I'm gonna do is replace top corresponds to the Y value. But for what we're going to do right now, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna do transform colon, translate 3D, and then just put zero pixels, zero pixels, zero pixels for the X, Y, and Z values. Let me delete that extra content right there. Okay, great. And so for transition, we wanna no longer listen to change on the top property, but we wanna listen to changes on the transform property instead. And the last change is right here, when I'm hovering over an element. Right now, if I were to hover over the squares, for example, notice that a change happens suddenly. And that makes sense because right now, there's actually no correlation between what is changing and what a transform is actually, or a transition is actually listening to. So let's go ahead and fix that. I'm gonna specify transform, translate 3D. And this time, the x value is zero pixels the Y value will be negative 150 pixels, which corresponds to the top value you had earlier. And then Z is gonna be zero pixels again, because I don't really care what is specified here as long as it is specified so that our GPU does all the work. Now if we were to hover over our content, notice what you see here. Oh, let me add a P here to fix that up. And now notice that our animation resumed, you know, returned to its earlier state where it just works beautifully. But the difference is that instead of your CPU doing all the work, Right now your GPU is doing work, which is exactly what we set out to do. And, and the thing I want you to pay attention to is how simple it was to actually go from an older model where we actually are animating one of the, one of the forbidden properties at this point and moving it to using Translate 3D. It was very simple. It only had a handful of things we changed, namely the old property to specify transform and Translate 3D modifying a transition, or in this case, if I this animation, similarly, modifying the property I'm listening to from the top, left, bottom, right, padding margin to transform, and then ensuring anywhere where I'm actually changing the position of the content that I'm actually replacing it with a transform and a translate 3D. So what you've just seen is a very quick overview of essentially how to go from having an animation that may not be very performant to make sure it's very performant by offloading a lot of work to the GPU. Now, some of the things to keep in mind are that if you're working in JavaScript, 
the same techniques apply. And actually I have articles written on how to make sure that you're sending a transform and a translate 3D values in JavaScript properly. And there's a little extra work you need to do mainly because of vendor prefixes and browser support and all of that. And I have articles on the site that help provide that information. But for the most part, just making a simple change, such as going from using traditional layout properties to change where your items are positioned to move to a transform causes one of the biggest performance gains you'll see, especially as your animations get more and more complex. And from now on, you'll see a lot of examples and future tutorials where I'm going to be using the transform and translate 3D values for setting position, whereas I'm going to use the earlier layout properties just to not confuse things, not to add too many concepts for you at the very introductory stages in animations. So with that, if you want to learn more, go to croup.com. There are plenty of articles on animation if you haven't already noticed by now. And if you have any questions or would like to you know, run some ideas by people, including me, just post in the forums at forum.croup.com. And you can find me on Twitter at Krupa, Facebook and YouTube. You know, I'm pretty much everywhere. So if you want to you know, ping me any of those things and I will try to get back to you within a reasonable period of time. And of course, all the stuff you've seen here and many more stuff are in my book called Animation in HTML, CSS and JavaScript, where I go into great detail, over 500 pages of detail, on how to basically create animations that are awesome and do really cool things. And you can find it on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle editions. And with that, I will see you guys next time in our next video.